was great. That was fantastic. He said, I've already, I've already started using what you taught me. And I'm thinking he's going to tell me about achieving a breakthrough with that's right. So I go, oh, okay, you know, yeah, tell me about it. And he says, I was texting my wife. <laughs> and she's always giving me a hard time about being at these conferences. And I try to explain to her that I'm trying to make a better life for us. And she's saying, you're just there partying. You want to leave me with the kids. And so this time, instead of trying to explain it to her again, I sent her a text that said, you're right. <laughs> she sent me back three hearts and two smiley faces. <laughs> that never happened before. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, oh, ah, oh, oh. That is not what I was trying to get you to do. <laughs> but we first really stumbled, stumbled over that's right is a phenomenal response. Because I'm negotiating, a, uh, I'm, I'm running the negotiation for kidnapping in the Philippines. A young man named Jeffrey Schilling has been grabbed. And it's, a, it's the first case I ran in the Philippines. And a terrorist group that are really bad guys, the leader of the group, was a, was a straight out of the movies, head shopping, raping, murdering, killing, sociopath with a f huge ego. He had, uh, he had the media on speed dial. They'd call him and they'd ask him questions in Tagalog, his local language. He'd answer in English because he wanted his voice to be on CNN. He even actually told some reporters he thought there should be a movie made about him. You could Google the, the terrorist group's name was the Abu Sayyaf. And if you Google the Abu Sayyaf uh, and you see anybody in the pictures, and from this time frame, he was always in the pictures if there's a guy with a black bandana, sunglasses, black T-shirt, camo pants, and a 45 on his side, that was Sabaya. It was always just one decked out like that. Sabaya so thought it made him look more photogenic, more of a dashing figure. So we've got this American named Jeff, and there's a $10 million demand for Jeff. Although he's not asking for ransom, he's asking for $10 million in war damages because of economic harm that's been done to the, the south of the Philippines for the last 500 years, from the Spanish to the Japanese to the Americans, to all the things that were wrong, done wrong by the American army under Blackjack Pershing. How many people know why U.S. military has 45 automatics? Why is that? Because there's a Philippine insurrection and the Moros who get hopped up on drugs and uh, one cloth that was very tight and creates They couldn't, they couldn't, uh, the people in the south of the Philippines are the Moros. And they couldn't stop, they couldn't knock them down mm -hmm. with 38s. They needed a bigger round. These are the people that have Jeff Schilling. These are warlike, fierce, tough, tough people. They're tough enough that one of the world's favorite most favorite handguns was built specifically to knock these guys down. Tough, tough characters. So they've been fighting off colonial powers for 500 years. So they got Jeff Schilling. They want $10 million for Jeff Schilling, but it's not ransom. It's economic damages. So we get started in the negotiation, and I'm coaching a guy because that's really what I did running international kidnappings overseas. I coached the negotiations. I know negotiations. I don't know your industry. I can bring you up to speed on negotiation faster than you can bring me up to speed on your industry. I got used to doing it. They put me in a country. I didn't know the language. I didn't know the culture. I had to be up and running inside of 12 hours. So I'm coaching a, a Philippine policeman named Benji. And Benji is a Philippine patriot. He it was also the leader of their, the Philippine police's SAF, the Special Action Force. And the SAF were dangerous people. On the good, on the good guy's side, but they were the equivalent of the Navy SEALs. And they sent the SAF out. And when I first met Benji, he'd been on 30 rescue missions that year. And they didn't take handcuffs. 30 firefights. Lots of dead bad guys behind them. So the SAF was feared for good reason. And thank God they were on our side. But Benji's a warrior. And he doesn't want to take this approach to negotiation because he wants to kill Sabaya. And he wants to tell Sabaya he's going to kill him. <laughs> so we're, and I remember late one night, we're, fi we're working with Benji, and I, I see a snarl coming over Benji's face because I could tell he doesn't like this soft approach. And this is the same as any negotiation you're in with a colleague where you can look at them and you know they don't like what you're saying. And so what you do is you got to get a that's right out of them, and you got to talk to them in a way, even if it sounds like it's against your interests, 
you got to say it in a way about how they feel about it. I looked at Benji, and I said, you hate Sabaya, don't you? He says, I tell you I do. He is murdered, and he is raped. He has come on our radios while we were bombing his position and said, these mortars are music to my ears. And the only reason that he can come on our radio is if he's standing over the body of one of my colleagues. I hate him. And in getting that out of him, I saw Benji center himself. And he went from being a good negotiator to a great negotiator, completely became comfortable with the strategy. So then we continued with Sabaya, and we couldn't get past the $10 million. No matter what, no matter how, what logical approach we tried, no logical approach could talk them out of the 10 mil. So I said, all right, next time we get Sabaya on the phone, we got one goal. We're going to get a that's right out of him. We're going to give the world according to Sabaya. And we're going to repeat everything that he said and how he feels about it and all the justifications, no matter how they seem counter to what we're com where we're coming from, we're going to repeat it the way he says it, and he's only going to be able to say one thing. It's going to be, that's right. So two days later, Benji gets on the phone with Sabaya, and he goes on and on about 500 years of oppression from the Spanish to the Japanese to the Americans. Violation of the fishing rights. It's a horrible injustice. Everything you're doing is justified. Every single thing that Sabaya had ever said or how he felt about it. And when Benji got done, it must have taken him five minutes to go through everything. There was a silence on the other end of the line. And Sabaya said, that's right. And never asked for another dime for Jeffrey Schilling. We went from 10 million to zero in one conversation. Completely went away. Everything. The negotiation took a couple of more turns. They tried to throw a couple of non-monetary obstacles in the way. They became so disorganized on the other side that Jeffrey Schilling finally just walked away. <laughs> Jeffrey Schilling, first of all, an American in the Philippines is bigger than every other Filipino anyway, so you stick out. And Jeffrey Schilling is an African-American, so he walks away in the south of the Philippines. He's walking down a dirt road by himself in the Philippines. A local farmer says, you got to be Jeffrey Schilling. <laughs> You're like, what doesn't fit, right? He says, yeah, I am. The military flew down, picked him up in a helicopter, flew him back to Manila. They held a big press conference. Jeffrey Schilling sat President of the Philippines on one side, Secretary of Defense on the other. Secretary of Defense outlined this daring rescue mission where they flew in with helicopters and they shot all these terrorists. And they were all mortally wounded and crawled off into the jungle and died. That's why we don't have any bodies or any weapons. <laughs> and Jeffrey kind of sat there and just kind of went, ah, OK, OK. And we got him out. <laughs> so I'm back in the Philippines a month later and, uh, on another case. And I, and I link up with Benji. And he says, you are not going to believe who called me last week. And I was like, who? Sabaya. Now, Sabaya didn't know Benji's real name and didn't know for sure where he worked, but he knew he had to either be with the police or the military, government official of some kind. Still had his phone number. Called him on the phone and said, hey, have you been promoted? I have no idea what you said to me on the phone. It's going to hurt Jeffrey. Whatever you said kept me from it. They should promote you. Hangs up. Remember that Billy Crystal, Robert De Niro analyzed this? You, you got a gift, you. <laughs> That's Sabaya saying, I don't know what it is. And he's saying, he's, you did something, and I still respect you. you. I don't know what you did. I know you did something, but I, I'd do business with you again. I'm in a negotiation with my son. He's, a he's playing football at the time. He's a lineman. Football linemen are interesting breeds. <laughs> They're a combination of like hard hat workers and Nassau scientists because they bring it every play. I mean, they put their head down and pow, they hit stuff. And the stuff they're trying to hit is moving. So they got to calculate how to get to them. I don't know, you know, we're out of football season, but the yeah, next professional fo football game you go to, 
the center walks up to the ball, and you notice there's nothing but conversation going on the line, which is fascinating because they're calling back code, coded signals to each other that Nassau couldn't crack. <laughs> and when they're not going, you know, Omaha, blue 69, 43, then in between that, they're going, I'm going to kick your ass to the other side. <laughs> so it's this combination of woofing and barking at each other and talking in code. Incredibly complicated. So he goes from lineman to linebacker. You know, does this stuff work on your children is the question. But a linebacker now has got to get out of the way of the blocks. Somebody tries to hit a linebacker, the linebacker pushes him and ducks. And my son is not doing this. He wants to hit everything he sees because that's what he's used to. And the coach is talking to him and I'm talking to him. And we'd say, look, a linebacker plays off blocks. It is not your job to hit everything that you see. And that's what you're supposed to make the tackle, not hit everything. And he would look at us, and what would he say? I would say, you're right. <laughs> say, you're right. Because an obstacle, a third, neutral third party, well, of course that's right. But when you're telling somebody something where you want, he doesn't want to hurt your feelings, but you're right. And he'd go right back to it the very next day. So I'm thinking, what? how do I get through this kid? So I think about how he's, you know, what, what's he seeing here, and why is he doing it? What's his motivation? So I pull him off to the side the next day, and I say, you think it's unmanly to drop, dodge a block. You think getting out of the way of somebody who's trying to hit you makes you a coward. And he said, that's right. He starts dodging blocks the next day. You are going to be surprised at what people will suddenly agree to if you get the words, that's right, out of them. 